Welcome back to tier 5 of the Weird Paleontology Iceberg. This is going to be the second last video of the iceberg since I'll combine both 6 and 7 into 1, meaning we're almost at the finish line. Thanks for all the support and if you've been keeping up with the series and haven't subscribed, consider doing so. I'm hoping I can hit 500 before the new year which would be awesome. Anyways let's get straight into the video, no more stalling. Overactive pituitary gland killed dinosaurs. Franz Baranowska, an influential and somewhat eccentric figure in paleontology, proposed an intriguing theory about the potential role of overactive pituitary glands in the extinction of dinosaurs. Nopska suggested that dinosaurs may have suffered from conditions related to the pituitary gland, leading to giant sizes and resulting in evolutionary disadvantages that contributed to their demise. Nopska's theory of evolutionary inertia basically suggested that the pituitary gland responsible for secreting growth hormones might have been overactive in certain dinosaur species. According to his hypothesis, this overactivity of the pituitary gland could have caused dinosaurs to grow to exceptionally large sizes, which in turn led to certain psychological and ecological disadvantages. He theorized that the disproportionately large sizes of some dinosaurs might have hindered their ability to adapt to changing environmental conditions, making them less flexible or agile compared to smaller species. To be honest, the first time I heard this, I merely thought about T-Rex and his arms compared to his body, maybe because of all the memes out there. I remember when some of my friends would poke at this one friend for having small arms, calling them T-Rex arms. Anyways, Nopska essentially believed that this evolutionary disadvantage, combined with environmental changes and other factors, could have contributed to the extinction of these giant creatures. In his research, Nopska examined various fossilized brain cases, searching for evidence of an enlarged pituitary gland in dinosaurs. Although this theory was really unique and interesting, it lacked empirical evidence, and the study of internal structures in fossilized remains was pretty limited during its time. Flying Dimetrodon Pairs Alright, to be honest, I couldn't really find anything on this entry when searching it up besides like a Reddit post, and I don't really know the whole context behind it, but from everyone's responses, I'm guessing it was like a joke or like an April Fool's thing, but yeah, that's pretty much all we have about the entry, so next entry. Fossil of the Witness to the Deluge Johann Jacob Swedger, a Swiss nationalist, scholar, and physician, published the book in 1726 titled Homo Diluvi Testis, Man Witness to the Deluge. In his book, Swedger described what he believed to be the fossilized remains of a human, suggesting that was evidence of a person who perished during the great flood described in the Bible. Swedger saw it as basically the historical proof of the biblical flood. This interpretation aligned with his religious beliefs and his attempt to find scientific evidence supporting the biblical narrative. However, when his claims were eventually analyzed by scientific research, it revealed that the fossilized bones he identified as a human actually belonged to an extinct giant salamander. The misidentification was corrected in 1811 when the French anatomist Georges Cuvier correctly identified the fossil as an ancient amphibian. So I started his case is often brought up as an example of an early misinterpretation of fossils because of religious or preconceived beliefs. Godzillas the Godzilla's fossil is a mysterious discovery that was unearthed in northern Kentucky by amateur paleontologist Ron Fine. The fossil, which dates back 450 million years, was found in the Cincinnati region, which was once covered by shallow seas making a favorable location for fossil discoveries. The fossil is approximately 3.5 feet wide and 6.5 feet long, making a significant and unusual find. The fossil is an unusual texture created by a directional pattern on its surface and was found with small animal fossils attached to it, known as tribulites which may provide clues necessary for the fossil's eventual identification. The discovery has stumped scientists though, and believe it or not, they're still trying to find its identity. The fossil has been subject of scientific study and debate, and its unique characteristics have led to various theories and speculations about it. And to be honest, the first time I heard this fossil, I thought it was going to be like super huge and like scary monster like Godzilla, but yeah, it's not really the case. Earth periodically restocks extinct animals. This entry is about the theory that Earth periodically restocks extinct animals, as proposed by John Michael and Robert Rickard. The theory attempts to explain the rediscovery of certain animals thought to be extinct, like the example of the Bermuda petrel, which was thought to have been exterminated in the 17th century, only for a colony to be rediscovered in 1951. Michael and Rickard extend the theory to cryptozoological appearances of saurians and ape men, suggesting that creatures now extinct contain the hot regions and phantom form, with occasional real physical appearances until the time comes to re-establish themselves. This theory, while not supported by scientific evidence, still raises some pretty interesting questions about extinction and the rediscovery of species. The theory of periodic restocking of extinct species, although speculative, goes to show the mysterious nature of the fossil record sometimes, and how new discoveries can change things in an instant. 
it's pretty cool to think that for 100 years, a creature could be believed to be extinct, and then like randomly discovery proves that we were all wrong. Biraptor and Evolutionary Bioparanoia The concept of Biraptor McLaughlin, as proposed by John McLaughlin in 1984, is a hypothetical creature that pretty much goes beyond mainstream science and into speculative fiction. McLaughlin's idea of a Biraptor envisions a creature resembling a sapient raptor or dinosauroid, which he presented as a more reasonable version compared to previous renditions. He described it as having a saurian appearance while still possessing an otherworldly or alien-like quality. McLaughlin used this hypothetical creature as part of a thought experiment discussing lost pre-human civilizations during the Mesozoic era. In his broad theory termed evolutionary bioparanoia, McLaughlin suggests that civilizations including hypothetical ancient ones are short-lived on geological timescales and leave minimal evidence of their existence. He proposed that these civilizations, like the hypothetical Bioraptor society, might have led to their own downfall through actions such as mass agriculture, excessive mineral extraction, environmental degradation, and even nuclear warfare, ultimately causing their own extinction. The idea of lost pre-human civilizations leaving minimal trace in the geological record has been brought up a few times actually in this iceberg chart, but with all the theories out there, it's still largely speculative. Sturkfontein Cave Psychometry The Sturkfontein Cave Psychometry is about the involvement of a psychic, Jeffrey Hodson, in an archaeological research project at the Starkfontein Caves, where the bones of the first discovered Australopithecus were found. Jeffrey Hodson, a member of the Theosophical Society, performed psychometry on the fossil remains at the caves. We introduced this topic earlier, and for a quick recap, it basically involves obtaining psychic impressions from an object. Hodson claimed to have recorded ghostly sounds imprinted on the fossils, which he interpreted as the horrified screams of a caveman's final moments. This dual collaboration between a psychic and a paleontologist concerning it was of such a significant archaeological site led to some interest in the discussion, since it blended both science and the paranormal. It comes up sometimes in the ongoing debate about the role of psychics in archaeological and paleontological research. Vascular plants evolved from inside-out lichens. Peter Astet's 1988 hypothesis proposing an unconventional origin for vascular plants offers a pretty interesting departure from the mainstream understanding of plant evolution. Astas suggested an alternative idea challenging the prevalent view that modern land plants descended from algae. Instead, he proposed a concept involving the symbiotic merger of a majority of algae with a mineral scavenging fungi component, resulting in an ancestral organism with distinct characteristics, or otherwise an inside-out structure where the majority of the organism was algae and the interior contained fungi. This idea suggests a departure from the typical understanding of lichens where fungi dominate the symbiotic relationship. Basically, Atsa's proposition presents a reverse scenario where the algae constitute the primary component, contrasting with the commonly observed structure of modern lichens. The hypothesis opens intriguing possibilities regarding the complexity of plant evolution and the potential for different symbiotic relationships to have played a role in shaping the characteristics of early plant ancestors. Longuisquama feathers were just leaves. The mysterious reptile Longuisquama from the Triassic period has intrigued scientists due to its distinct feature, that being long feather-like structures along its back. These structures, resembling elongated hockey-shaped quills or scales, have sparked a few fringe theories about their nature and purpose. One of these theories presents an alternative explanation, suggesting that what appears to be feathers on Longusquama were in fact leaves or plant matter accidentally preserved with the fossilized remains. Their argument primarily relies on the observation that in only just one fossil specimen, are the presumed feathers directly associated with the animal's body. In other cases, the feather-like structures were found separately, not in connection with the animal's remains. So you can see how it actually does make a reasonable theory, like if I was a paleontologist, I'd probably think the same. However, the fact is though, this interpretation still remains controversial for several reasons. Firstly, the mode of preservation observed in Longuisquama fossils is inconsistent with the preservation of plant material. Additionally, attempts to identify these supposed leaves with any known plants from the Triassic era have not been successful, casting doubt on the theory. Lacasse Subterra Erosion Theory Claude Nicolas Lacasse, a French surgeon in the 18th century, proposed an unconventional theory about the Earth's structure and its eventual fate. In 1744, Lacasse introduced the concept of subterranean erosion, suggesting that Earth was gradually collapsing inward due to erosion occurring beneath the surface. According to his theory, this ongoing erosion would eventually hollow out the Earth entirely. Lacat's hypothesis implied a cyclic process, reflecting his belief in reoccurrence or repetition in natural phenomena. He envisioned a future where the Earth would collapse inward completely and result in a hollow interior. Following this complete collapse, Lacat believed that the Earth would re-emerge, 
restarting the process of erosion and collapse once again. The theory presented by Lacat was really unconventional for its time, and so it is a great contrast to the prevailing scientific understanding of geology and the Earth's structure. His theory ended up getting not much traction within the scientific community. Over time, advancements in geology and Earth sciences have provided alternative, evidence-based explanations for the Earth's structure and processes, which again don't align with Lacat's theory. Dinosaurs were going extinct before the meteor. The study led by Fabian Lacondamine and colleagues in 2021 presents a really interesting perspective suggesting that dinosaurs might have actually been experiencing a decline even before the famous meteor impact event, which everyone knows about. The study's findings challenge a long-held assumption that the meteor impact was the sole cause of the demise of non-avian dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous period. Kahnemann's research points to a significant decline in herbivores non-avian dinosaurs towards the end of the Cretaceous era. They suggest that this decline might have been influenced by specific factors, such as the dominance of hadrosaurs, a type of herbivorous dinosaur, potentially outcompeting other herbivores, leading to a reduction in overall diversity among herbivorous dinosaurs. Also, the study suggests that the risk of extinction among these dinosaurs might have been associated with the age of species during this decline. This finding implies that certain species might have been less adaptable or lacked evolutionary novelty necessary to cope with changing environmental conditions, thereby making them more vulnerable to extinction. Preformatationism Preformatationism is a historical idea about the development of organisms, mostly in medieval and early modern times. It proposed that all living beings were preformed during the initial creation of the Earth, existing in miniature form within their parents. This concept suggested that within each being reside a fully formed and tiny version of themselves, which would grow and develop through maturation rather than originating from an embryo or seed. The notion of preformatationism had historical roots, with some early proponents including the poet naturalist Lucretius from the late Roman Empire. Who knew people were interested in paleo even back then? Lucretius formulated a theory that all species didn't evolve but were born directly from the Earth's surface. He proposed that the Earth, when young and vigorous, could give birth to myriad giant and exotic creatures. According to Lucretius, the seeds or atoms of every conceivable creature were stored within the Earth's womb, and as Earth aged, it lost its vitality to produce large creatures resulting in the emergence of smaller ones directly from the soil. This early concept resembles a form of preformatationism, where the existence of organisms was thought to be preordained and inherent in the Earth's composition from its inception. It attributed the origin and development of living beings to a predetermined blueprint within nature, rather than to the process of embryonic development or evolutionary change. Pterosaurs couldn't fly. Right, so this is a pretty wild claim that pterosaurs could not fly, as was suggested by Katsufumi Sato's research. Sato's studies use accelerometers attached to the wings of albatrosses to calculate the necessary wingspan to weight ratio for flight, and he concluded that even conservative reconstructions of large pterosaurs, such as Quetzalcoatlus, were too heavy to fly or glide. However, those who argued against this theory claimed that the comparison to albatrosses is misleading and arbitrarily selected. Recent studies have provided new insights into pterosaur flight capabilities. For instance, an international team of scientists used imaging techniques to uncover details of pterosaur soft tissue, and their modeling suggested that certain pterosaurs had the capability to launch themselves from water. Also, quantitative tests have been used to assess the flight potential of hatchling pterosaurs, with some studies suggesting that even little hatchlings, well maybe not little considering the insane size of pterosaurs, had the capacity for sustained far-reaching glides. But the unique flight-related anatomy of pterosaurs such as their long, tapering wings and hollow bones is still being researched. Therefore, the debate over pterosaur flight capabilities still continues. Breeding stones This idea is about the concept of stones, fossils, or minerals engaging in a form of reproduction or birth that's existed across some historical and cultural contexts. This notion, known as breeding stones, proposes that these geological objects have the ability to copulate or generate offspring, like organic life forms. In the 18th century, Michael Valentini, a scientific authority of that time, proposed a theory that stones could breed or reproduce deep within the earth. Similar ideas were also persistent in folklore and cultural traditions across Europe. For instance, in Irish and English folklore, there were beliefs surrounding revered boulders known as rock mothers. These boulders were thought to possess small hollows from which smaller stones were believed to be born. The belief was that these smaller stones in turn could produce more stones, symbolizing a form of reproduction within the natural world. When I was working on my ancient structures video a while back, stones were actually pretty common in the entries like the Easter Island statues. So after researching a bunch of those topics, I can see how people of ancient times could attribute these beliefs to rocks or stones. Harley Garbani ESP Harley Garbani, an amateur fossil hunter, 
was renowned for his exceptional ability to discover unique fossils. He attributed his success to a heightened sense of intuition, which he believed guided him to these finds. Even professional paleontologists were amazed at the effectiveness of Gorbani's intuition, with some suggesting that it bordered on what could be considered as actual telepathic insight or extrasensory perception, or other words ESP like the entry says. Gorbani's discoveries, which include significant dinosaur finds, were highly regarded in the paleontological community. His work has left a lasting impact and his prime fossil finds are on display and his prime fossil finds are on display at prestigious institutions. Some of these include the Natural History Museum at Los Angeles, the University of California Museum of Paleontology, and the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. Even though he was an amateur, Gavani's work was the envy of professionals, and he was revered by scientists who spoke in near mystical terms of his ability for finding fossils. Linksia Cheetah The Linksia Cheetah, also known as Asininix Cortini, was a shocking discovery of a primitive cheetah skull from China. The fossil was initially reported to be one of the oldest cheetah fossils ever found, with an estimated age of approximately 2.2 to 2.5 million years. The discovery was published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, which was a pretty big deal. However, the authenticity of the fossil was soon called into question by other scientists, who alleged that the skull was a hoax, with parts composed of plaster. Even though there is a controversy, the article was not retracted until 2012 and the authors maintained that they didn't mean to deliberately hoax anyone. The case of the Linksia cheetah in turn helped highlight the real problem of fakes and the murkiness of the fossil supply chains, especially in the black market fossil trade. To be honest, I didn't even know there was a black market fossil trade. The fossil was ultimately accepted as a forgery in 2012 and is now considered a discredited specimen. Primeval Universal Ocean Abraham Werner's concept of the universal ocean proposed in 1787 was a significant idea in the field of geology during its earlier years. Werner, a prominent geologist, suggests that the Earth's surface was initially covered by a vast and all-encompassing ocean termed the Universal Ocean. According to Werner's theory, this ocean was responsible for shaping the Earth's geological formations. The Neptunism theory put forward by Werner proposed that the various geological strata observed on the Earth's surface were formed as the Universal Ocean gradually receded over extended periods. As the water diminished, it revealed the underlying sea floor and left behind layers of sedimentary material. Werner attributed the creation of these geological strata to the accumulation of loose mineral materials that were deposited due to the actions of waves and storms within the universal ocean. Werner's Neptunism theory was foundational in the early discourse of geology, creating debate and serving as a contrast to the competing theory of Plutonism. Plutonism, advocated by James Hutton and others, proposed that geological formations were primarily a result of volcanic activity and the eternal heat of the earth rather than the actions of water. Spermatic Theory of Fossils The spermatic theory was a historical concept centered on the idea that fossils, particularly fossilized animals or the remains found in rocks, were formed by the impregnation of inanimate matter, like rocks or minerals, by some form of organic seeds or material similar to sperm. This theory emerged in a time when scientific understanding of geological and biological processes was super early. The concept was based on a belief that the existence of an amniotic earth or earth womb, a notion that the earth itself had reproductive powers similar to living organisms. According to this theory, it was suggested that the earth possessed generative qualities and that under specific circumstances, mineral substances could incubate or foster the growth of organic material resembling seeds or germs, and which would lead to the formation of fossils within the rocks. The term spermatic originates from the belief that these organic entities could give rise to new life forms or that they contained the potential for life. However, this concept was a speculative and non-scientific explanation for the origin of fossils. It was proposed in an era when the study of geology and biology lacked much research. A lot of these old theories I feel like people could have made movies out of, since they are pretty creative in my opinion. Humans equal pig chimp hybrid. Alright, so this one I could definitely say belongs on this weird paleontology iceberg chart. Eugene McCarthy, a genesis with a PhD, has proposed a controversial theory suggesting that modern humans are the result of interbreeding between pigs and ape-like animals millions of years ago. This theory, also known as the chimp-pig hybrid theory, suggests that multiple hybridization events took place at different times, producing different hominid species that we now know. McCarthy provides a list of anatomical evidence to support his theory. He points out similarities seen between humans and pigs, like our high infertility compared to other animals, our stomach valves, and hairlessness. He also connects that humans and pigs share similar organ and skin structures. McCarthy's theory isn't really based on genetic sequence comparisons though, and instead simply anatomical. 
This theory has been met with a bunch of criticism, as you might presume, and skepticism from the scientific community. One of the main criticisms is that pigs and chimpanzees have a different number of chromosomes, making the idea of a pig-chimp hybrid not possible. Critics also argue that the theory requires interbreeding between separate orders of animals, which is highly unlikely. Kluski Ape Man Seance In 1919, during a seance, which is basically like a meeting for people to try to talk to spirits, which was held by Franek Kluski, a well-known medium, there was a claim of an unusual presence. Kluski was actually reputed for summoning ghostly figures during these spiritual sessions. In this particular seance, a figure representing Pithecanthropus appeared. Pithecanthropus was once thought to be a kind of missing link between humans and apes, and was said to look like a gibbon-like ape man with shaggy, coarse hair. According to a witness, Cole Nerber Okolowisk, the apartion was remarkably strong, capable of moving heavy furniture and lifting people while seated in their chairs. Despite its intimidating appearance and behavior, the entity was reported to be non-harmful, often showing goodwill and readiness to obey. The pithecanthropus is essentially an outdated term that was historically used to describe what we now know as Homo erectus, an extinct species of early humans. The term was coined in the late 19th century by Eugene Dubius after the discovery of the first Homo erectus remains in Java, Indonesia. The story of the pithecanthropus tulpa is an example of the early 20th century spiritualism and the fascination with the possibility of contacting spirits or entities from different times. Agassiz's Fish Dream Louis Agassiz was a renowned 19th century scientist who encountered a challenging fossilized fish specimen that was partially obscured by rock. As he was struggling on how to extract it without causing damage, Agassiz experienced a series of dreams over three nights. In these dreams, he saw the complete form of the fish with all its features. Initially, he couldn't remember the details upon awakening, but on the third night, he was prepared with a pencil and paper by his bed. After dreaming of the fish again, he quickly sketched what he had seen in the dream. The next morning, he found that the sketch included details he hadn't consciously realized were possible for the fossil. Using the sketch as a guide, Agassiz was able to carefully chisel away the stone and successfully revealed the fish fossil, which matched the image from his dream. This fossil turned out to be a really important discovery and was later included in his significant work on paleontology, the Poisson's Fossils, published in 1843. To be honest, that is actually pretty wild, thinking a dream was the ultimate reason for the proper carving of the fossil. I don't know too much about neuroscience, but I think we still don't really know too much about dreams, so accounts like these make the mysteries about it even more cool. Nessie is a giant Tully monster. Loch Ness Monster is a really famous cryptid I'm sure everyone has heard of. Also on the topic of cryptids, after this series is done, I'll definitely try to look around for a good iceberg chart I could cover. So expect that very soon, I got ya. Anyways, Ted Holliday, a former angler and Loch Ness Monster who transitioned into a passionate investigator of the mysterious creature known as Nessie, proposed an intriguing theory in his book, The Worm of Loch Ness. He put forward the idea that the mysterious Loch Ness Monster was in fact a colossal Tully monster a prehistoric creature famously referred to as the Tully Monster. Holiday's theory about Nessie being a Tully Monstrum was quite unconventional. Also, it gets even more interesting where he speculated about the possibility of underwater time portals, suggesting that the creature could pass through these portals in the depths of the Loch Ness. As Holiday's investigation progressed, his viewpoints even evolved. Over time, he started to see Nessie as more of a supernatural entity than a physical being. Supernova Kill Dinosaurs The supernova theory proposing the extinction of dinosaurs was suggested by Dale Russell and Willis Tucker in 1971. They speculated that a nearby exploding star, or supernova, might have been responsible for the demise of dinosaurs. This idea gained attention when scientists discovered higher than usual deposits of iridium on the cretaceous pelagene boundary strata about 10 years later. The background on iridium is basically it's relatively rare on Earth's surface, but it's found in higher concentrations on objects like asteroids and comets. This theory held promise as the iridium deposits seem to support the idea of a massive cosmic event, such as a supernova explosion, contributing to extinction. However, the theory later faced challenges as scientists expected to find plutonium, another element associated with cosmic events, alongside the iridium deposits. When researchers failed to find the anticipated plutonium, it casted doubts on the validity of this explanation. As a result, the supernova theory, while fascinating, lost its credibility as a primary explanation for the dinosaur extinction. Odin Stolvo Giant Brains in 1925, a remarkable discovery in a Moscow coal quarry near Adesovo railway station made headlines. Two objects resembling giant fossilized brains were found. Dr. N. Grigorovich initially identified these as unusually large human brains, a claim supported by French anonymous B.K. Hinzi, triggering widespread curiosity and debate. The suggestion that these objects could be human brains from the Carboniferous period intrigued many scientists. 
the idea of brain tissue fossilizing over such an extensive period would have been extremely rare, so it's kind of like a miracle. As the news circulated, the scientific community grew increasingly doubtful about the identification. Questions arose about how soft and perishable brain tissue could survive millions of years. Some scientists proposed alternative explanation, suggesting that the specimens might have been misidentified elephant brains, or plant matter with resemblance to brains. Chi Ang Gu Chi Ang Gu, a Malaysian researcher, gained attention for his unconventional claims in paleontology. He asserts that he has identified numerous baby dinosaurs by interpreting rocks with shapes that resemble juvenile reptiles. Gu refers to his unique approach as petrified embryology, a self-proclaimed new field in paleontological study. However, Gu's claims have not gained widespread acceptance within the scientific community. Many paleontologists are skeptical of his methodology and findings, as they often lack scientific evidence or consensus to support his interpretations. Their interpretation of rock formations as representing embryonic or juvenile dinosaurs requires substantial and verifiable evidence, which Gu's work has yet to provide. So yeah, that's basically about the entry. I didn't really find too much on this topic on the internet, besides like a blog from Chi and Gu explaining how he's still trying to get evidence and stuff for his theory. Pangenesis Gemulus Pangenesis was a theory proposed by Charles Darwin to explain the process of heredity before the discovery of genes. Darwin recognized the importance of environmental factors and random variations in the evolutionary process, but he lacked a clear understanding of how traits were physically transmitted from parents to offspring. In an attempt to bridge this gap, he formulated the provisional concept of pangenesis. Darwin postulated that the body cells share gemulus, or living atoms containing heredity information that circulated throughout an organism's body and eventually gathered in the reproductive organs. These gemules were then believed to be passed down to the next generation, determining the traits of the offspring. Despite Darwin's efforts, Pangesis faced skepticism even among his contemporaries. Darwin himself had doubts about the theory, and it was never fully embraced by supporters or the scientific community. Cometary Earth Theory William Whiston's new theory of Earth proposed a unique explanation for major historical events aligning them with literal interpretations of the Bible. In 1696, Wiston suggested that comets were the primary cause beyond catastrophic occurrences in Earth's history. His theory attributed significant events such as the fall of man described in Genesis to specific comet impacts. According to Wiston, a comet striking the Earth initiated the rotational motion mentioned in the biblical narrative of humanity's descent. He further linked cometary impacts to the biblical story of Noah's flood and other historical events like the plague of Egypt. Remarkably, he even associated everyday weather events such as rain with the influence of comets. Despite his elaborate connections between comets and historical events, Weston's ideas were considered heretical during his time. His contemporaries, including the renowned scientist Isaac Newton, did not fully embrace his theories. Weston's work foreshadowed concepts that would emerge in later centuries, like the Shiva hypothesis, the Nemesis and Nibiru theories, and the works of Emanuel Vilankovsky. Aquatic Pterosaurs in 1784, Cosimo Alessandro Calini reconstructed pterosaur fossils and suggested that these creatures were aquatic, envisioning them as animals that swam using their wings as paddles. This idea persisted until around 1830. During this time, Johann Georg Wagler proposed a theory that grouped pterosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and plesiosaurs together as ancestral monotremes. Monotremes are egg-laying mammals like the platypus and echidnas. Wagner speculated that these ancient monotremes eventually evolved into marine creatures such as whale and dolphins. Moreover, Wagner specifically proposed that pterosaurs were direct ancestors of dolphins, suggesting a close evolutionary relationship between these flying reptiles and marine mammals. This theory represented a significant attempt to understand the relationships between different ancient animals based on their anatomical features and habits. However, with advancements in paleontology and the discovery of new fossils, scientific understanding has evolved over time. Presently, the idea that pterosaurs were fully aquatic creatures like dolphins is not widely supported in the scientific community. Instead, modern research and findings suggest that pterosaurs were flying reptiles that soared through the skies rather than swimming through the waters. Scrotum Humanum The first scientific description of a dinosaur fossil dates back to 1763 when Richard Brookies examined a megalosaurus femur bone. Back then, without knowledge of dinosaurs, Brookies believed this bone belonged to a giant human. He correctly identified it as a femur, noting its resemblance to human testicles, and humorously labeled it as Scrotum Humanum. The original name given by Brookies for an megalosaurus, and by extension, all dinosaurs, raised an interesting debate in scientific naming conventions. However, the International Commission for Zoological Nomenclature ruled against retaining the name Scromin Humanum for megalosaurus. Some paleontologists like Bill Sargent at Beverly Halstead 
along with historians of science like M.J. Rudwick, amusingly agree that dinosaurs should have, by rights, retained the less dignified and comical original title given by Brookies. They see this as a departure from the norm in scientific nomenclature. Jackalope Spider Hoax The Jackalope Spider was a clever hoax on the internet to create a conceiving but entirely fabricated story. In 2015, a photoshopped image started circulating online, depicting a creature that appeared to be a combination of a spider and a jackrabbit, dubbed the Jackalope Spider. The image showed a creature with the body of a spider but with the head and ears of a jackrabbit, leading many to believe that such a bizarre creature existed. However, the image was digitally altered, merging different animal features to create an entirely fictional creature. While the jackalope itself is a mythical creature from American folklore, a cross between a jackrabbit and antelope, the idea of a jackalope spider was a completely invented concept, intended to amuse and deceive people online. The hoax quickly spread across social media and various websites, capturing the attention of many intrigued by its peculiar appearance. However, experts and fact checkers soon debunked the image, clarifying that it was a digitally manipulated creation and not an actual living creature. Alright, so that's tier 5 down. That leaves just tier 6 and 7. I'll hopefully have the video out by like 2 days. But yeah, thank you for watching. Um, let me know your thoughts in the comments if you have anything to say. Some feedback or anything, you know. But anyways, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you for watching and hope you all have a good day. Bye.